So good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming um, to this seminar on killer robots and the case against them. Um, some of you might have been here earlier on drone events, on disaster drones or armed drones. Um, today we're here to discuss technology that takes this a step further. Um, we're looking at armed uh, autonomous weapons or killer robots, as they're sort of more publicly known. Um, this seminar is a joint initiative between the newly established Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies and two working groups at PRIO on humanitarianism and law and ethics. Um, and I think our goal here is to begin a conversation, a public conversation in Norway, or actually to contribute, obviously it's been going on for a while, to contribute to public conversation in Norway about this kind of technology. As we've seen in the election, um, these perspectives are pretty absent. It's not something we're discussing. Um, but it's a really intensely political issue. Um, autonomous weapons might not be on your doorstep tomorrow or next week, but they might be around next month. And we think it's important <laughs> that we actually begin thinking about this, begin understanding what this is about and what the implications are for the future of war. And to help us understanding these issues, I'm, I'm very excited about having three experts here today that will illuminate this issue from various angles. Um, first, Alexander Harang, he's the director of the Norwegian Peace Association, Fredslage, and he's an expert on the arms trade and very active in the international campaign to ban killer robots. Uh, and then there is Kjetil Mijezinovic Larsen, uh, who is a professor at law and an expert in human rights and humanitarian law with a particular focus on peace operations at the Norwegian <coughs> Center for Human Rights. And we have Tobias Mahler, who is an associate professor of the Department of Private Law. Uh, he focuses on internet governance and automated technology uh, and law at the Norwegian Research Center for uh, Computers and Law. And, and what I hope that we can do today is to get a good sense of the debate. First, what exactly is the campaign to stop killer robots? Who are they? What is their goal? And what do they want? And how do they want to get, about, get what they want? And second, um, the key argument uh, back and forth, from back and forth between lawyers, is that a robot soldier will not be able to obey human rights and humanitarian law rules. Is this so? Uh, what are the various viewpoints? And third, is it really feasible to insist on a ban where so much of the technological development will happen in small baby steps? I mean, will it not go from unmanned to automated to autonomous? Um, and, and just to give you sort of a very brief explanation of the concepts, the drone debate we've been having over the past year has been about unmanned drones. So the drone flies out, collects the data, <coughs> The human operator sets up the alternatives and makes the decision. The more automated versions, they go out, collect the data, and set up <coughs> alternatives, you know, develop various analysis of the situation, and then the human person makes the decision. An autonomous weapon or an autonomous platform will go out, collect the data or you know, the surveillance, give you certain alternatives, but then make the decision about itself. You know, make the decision, for example, to fire on a target itself. <coughs> so that's sort of a brief overview of, of the three, three sort of alternatives here. Um, but I think I'm actually just going to start with Alexander and give you the word. Um, thank, you. thank you. Yes, we have sound. Um, these are yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation, Kristin. Um, it's uh, great to be here, and um, uh, as uh, Kristin mentioned, I'm the national spokesperson for this campaign here in, here in Norway. Uh, but I never had the chance to talk about it before now, so this is a premiere, so to speak. Um, the um, the um, Norwegian Peace Association, uh, we have a little bit of uh, our material, a couple of reports. Uh, I think we have a few of the human um, of the uh, the um, the losing humanity report as well, which uh, is the human rights watch report, that uh, that sort of uh, yeah, that, that, that was the foundation of this argument. It came out late late last year, and we uh, founded this campaign in April this year. 
So it's really new and fresh. The campaign to stop kill robots. Uh, it is an international coalition of uh, 45 NGOs. Uh, these are based in 20 countries. Uh, we also have 10 international organizations with us. And uh, of course, a long range of scientists and Nobel laureates and other VIPs that, that are part of the campaign and, and, uh, and that are promoting it. Um, I also put up this, this thing down here, uh, International <coughs> Committee for, uh, for uh, Robot Arms Control. Um, that's just to give you a little bit of background to it, because of course, a campaign like this just just doesn't uh, come out of nothing. <laughs> um, some people have been around and thought out a few things before. And uh, ICRAC, uh, of course, we in the peace movement, just as the peace researchers love the acronyms, uh, the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, I should learn to say that, um, was, uh, I mean, they were founded back in 2009. And if you look at their founding documents and look at what they were interested in doing, uh, it sort of summarizes a lot of the ideas and the, a lot of the the perspectives that uh, we from the traditional peace movement bring with us into this campaign. Um, back in 2009, when they were established, uh, they, uh, they uh, agreed upon this founding document where they call upon the international community to urgently commence a discussion about an arms control regime to reduce the threat posed by robotic systems. And they put up five elements to this. First element, their potential to lower the threshold of armed <coughs> conflict. I mean, this is the basic principle that we in the peace movement um, uh, start almost all our thinking when it comes to drone technology and drone warfare and opposition to this. This is where it comes from. It's easier to kill with a joystick than a knife, uh, lowering the threshold of violence. Secondly, um, the uh, prohibition of the development, deployment, and the use of armed autonomous unmanned systems, saying that machines should not be allowed to make the decisions to kill people, which is exactly what this campaign to stop killer robots is all about. And thirdly, uh, limitations on the range and uh, weapons carried by unmanned systems and uh, their deployment in uh, postures that are threatening to other states. And fourthly, a ban on arming unmanned systems with nuclear weapons. And uh, lastly, the uh, prohibition of the development, deployment and use of robot space weapons. Now, all these elements are sort of traditional disarmament uh, issues within the traditional peace movement, which I represent. Of course, Norwegian Peace Association is, you know, uh, it's been here since the 1880s. Um, it's a rather traditional uh, organization when it comes to, to the disarmament. But these are, you know, some of the, the, the new features of our, um, uh, yeah, of our disarmament thinking over the last years. Um, let's go to the, I mean, we are, we are a campaign, of course, and you cannot be a campaign if you don't have any demands. So what are the demands? First of all, it's a call for an international agreement to prohibit uh, the fully autonomous weapons. Um, this is, um, uh, to, or to put it in another way, to put in place international legal barriers to stop such weapon being developed and deployed in armed conflict. Um, the preemptive and comprehensive ban, uh, this is the most important thing to remember, that this is about you know, trying to outlaw development of weapon systems that are not fully developed yet. So it's preemptive um, and the comprehensive ban on the development, production and use. Development, production and use, just as we've seen uh, as the approach to landmines, cloth munitions and so on. Um, we're also looking at national moratoriums and laws. And we've actually done a little bit on that. Uh, we might get back to that in the discussions. Uh, and we're also looking at other measures. But that's the basic demands. Um, when it comes to kill robots, what is kill robots? Um, of course, we heard a little bit in the introduction here about what it is. Uh, killer robots, usually in English, we call it lethal autonomous robotics, LAR. Um, that is, weapon systems that identify an attack without any direct human control. Uh, just like Kristen said. Um, what is important to remember is, of course, this, this is a future scenario. Uh, if you look at that um, Losing Humanity report over there uh, from Human Rights Watch, uh, it estimates that uh, this will be uh, a battleground scenario, these sort of weapons, in 10 to 20 years. So it's a little bit ahead of us. But that's exactly why it's so important to start right now, if you want to. <laughs> hinder its development. Uh, the degree of uh, human decision-making needed for the weapon system to function uh, is what is 
within this autonomous uh, this this um, this uh, this uh, autonomous world or or um, yeah and one way that we usually um, try to explain this in a simple way is to look at the road to autonomy from from today's drones and towards these these uh, killer robots. Uh, usually we, we start off with three categories. Uh, first category being uh, human controlled systems, so-called human in the loop system, um, which is um, which is um, uh, yeah, which is uh, the sort of drone technology we are with today. Um, that's uh, weapon systems that can perform. Uh, tasks delegated to them independently, uh, but humans are in the loop. Uh, secondly, uh, human supervised systems. That's what we call human on the loop systems. That is, uh, weapon systems that can conduct targeting process independently, but theoretically remain under the real time supervision of a human operator who can override these automatic, uh, these automatic decisions. And then thirdly, the autonomous systems, the human out of the loop. Uh, that is the uh, systems that we're talking about, as, uh, or, or that we call the, the killer robots, that can search, identify, select, and attack targets without any human control. So um, here's a few pictures, uh, just to give you an idea. Um, I would say that um, this thing down here, the phalanx, uh, it's a weapon system, anti-aircraft gun. Um, deployed on more than 140 uh, Navy ships, uh, American Navy ships at the moment. Uh, this is as far as we've got uh, right now uh, when it comes to autonomous weapons. This is a weapon system that identifies incoming missiles or aircrafts and then makes the decision to shoot at it and, uh, yeah, for air defense. Uh, many people think about those kind of things uh, as uh, as, as, as killer robots, but they're, they're, they're pretty far from it, actually. Um, of course, robot technology like this, I mean, having a sensor <coughs> put, on, uh, put on a set of wheel operated by a human to, uh, you know, uh, detect bombs or, 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 or whatever in the battlefield, uh, I mean, that's, that's nothing new. I mean, if you just look at US Army, they got about 7 million of those. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not about robotics in the Army. Um, even those kind of things where you have a small arm uh, on top of a robot. Uh, <coughs> these things have been deployed in battle zones since, um, since 2005. Uh, it's nothing new about it. But these things are, are dependent upon a human to, uh, to steer them and to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to make them operate. Um, if you look at that picture up there on the right, the XP-47, that's the drone that is uh, sort of the, the, the poster drone for, for, for new drone technology. Uh, this is a drone that uh, takes off from a, uh, a, uh, a uh, it, it can both land and take off without any human control. But it's still pretty far from what we call autonomous weapons. It's just a step towards them. Just before the summer, it was uh, yeah. You saw them on uh, you saw this drone on TV many on many occasions probably, um, showing up how it could um, how it could fly without any any human interference. But then again, it doesn't uh, it doesn't identify the target and kill it by itself. So um, it's about technology policy law. Uh, of course, this um, this um, this theme is um, is a, of course a very complex theme. But to make it a little bit simple, which is what Christian asked me, um, I'm trying to trying to to uh, to put the thinking of the campaign into into these three three uh, yeah into these these um, three concepts. Uh, the situation is that we have a very rapid development of robot technology. But at the same time, we have a very slow evolution of the law <laughs> governing these matters. And this dichotomy is, uh, is, um, is uh, rather difficult. And this is being acknowledged by world leaders, um, not only in the Western world, but, but uh, also, also in, in many new countries. And um, that's why policy becomes so important that uh, you know, policy becomes essential to guide future technolo technological developments in this field, simply because 
the uh, laws governing this type of technology is developing, is developing so slowly. Um, the main concerns uh, are legal, ethical, and society, uh, societal. Um, Kirsten already mentioned uh, a little bit about the international humanitarian law, the ability of uh, killer robots to conform to existing law, whether it's international humanitarian law, human rights law, or general international law. Uh, it, it's, um, yeah, it's a challenge on all, or it's a concern on, on all levels. Um, it also challenges uh, arms control regimes and the disarmament machinery in many new ways which we have to deal with. And uh, maybe most importantly, especially for us peace activists, uh, the ethical limits to machines deciding on the life and death of humans, that's the gravest concern. So why is it that computers should not kill humans? Well, there's many reasons for that. First of all, a computer is basically just as stupid as my dishwasher. Robots depend upon human specifications to do just about anything. And there's so many things that humans cannot specify. Uh, most importantly, when it comes to humanitarian law, international humanitarian law, it's distinguishing between civilian and combatant. <laughs> now, how can you trust the machine to make that distinction in a, uh, in a battlefield scenario? scenario? Uh, when you think about the common reasoning that any soldier uh, depend upon to do any, uh, for, for any sort of situational awareness, as they call it in the military, to make these observations, I mean, that common sense is not, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty far from what a computer can do at this moment. We're, because we as humans are not able to specify exactly what it is. Uh, you know, even such thing that should be uh, thought about as rather simple, how to distinguish between a boy and a full-grown man, or, or uh, I mean, even, even those kind of things can be quite difficult when it comes to computers. And um, even more difficult, what are the appropriate violence uh, measures when engaging an enemy combatant? Uh, how is a computer to, to make these decisions? Uh, what sort of reasoning uh, do, um, do, uh, do we need to make these, these decisions in accordance to, to IHL, for instance? Uh, it's very hard to see that computers uh, will be able to, uh, to deal with this issue in the right way. And of course, we have a rather big problem with the chain of command here. I mean, who's, who's responsible when a uh, robot kills in a battlefield? Uh, what if something, something goes wrong? What if the robot kills an innocent bystander, if it kills, kills a civilian? Who's responsible for this? Is it the president who, who, uh, who deployed the, the, the robot out in the, the battlefield? Or is it the programmer? who uh, obviously didn't write the perfect software for the robot. Uh, there are many uh, interesting uh, issues here. And of course, a, a robot cannot go to trial. Somebody has to be there. There has to be some human responsibility. So who has the responsibility when computers go wrong? Um, the campaign is uh, young and fresh, as I said. We started up in, in, in April, but we already have a sort of, uh, we have already had the beginning of a UN track when it comes to our demand. In, uh, April, in April this year, we had the Haynes Report, that's the Special Rapporteur on extra juridical Killings, um, uh, at the UN, uh, uh, writing the report on, on autonomous weapons. So this uh, UN expert uh, report uh, gave us the first, the first uh, high-level panel discussion among states on the, on, on the issue of, of autonomous weapons. This was done in May the 30th of May 2013 at the Human Rights Council. And it was interesting. It was 25, 24 states participating. And, um, and we managed to get something going there. Um, we have had very many meetings with, I mean, the campaign has had very many meetings with different states and, uh, over, the, over these months, from May until now. And last night we had a meeting in Geneva uh, with more than 20 states um, discussing the next steps which uh, is something that we spend a lot of time within the campaign discussing these days, which has to do with the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, the CCW. Um, this, uh, this body meets uh, one time a year, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's in November. Next time is in November. And right now we're discussing how to, 
to uh, to to bring our demands uh, further to the uh, to, to the CCW. That's the biggest discussion at the moment. I'm spending a little bit of time. Am I? Uh, I'll be quick. Yep. In conclusion, <laughs> um, the window of opportunity is right now. Um, that's the most important. Before the uh, military industrial complex gets too much of an interest in the development of these weapon systems, we need to act. If we want to prevent these things from being developed, we have to act right now. And uh, just as we've seen with the nuclear weapons, it's pretty hard to put a genie back in the bottle when it's first out. Even when you have a disastrous weapon like a nuclear weapon, uh, which, um, which uh, just about any person on Earth would, uh, would, would, would call inhumane, uh, it's pretty hard to uninvent <laughs> something that is already out there. So if we want to be effective, uh, in, uh, in this issue, we have to act right now. And uh, as the last comment, uh, it's interesting to think about autonomous killing machines as um, something that is not only, or not, not only sci-fi. If you look at what happened with uh, the anti-personnel mines, it's a little bit interesting. I mean, that's, not, that's an autonomous killing machine, isn't it? That's a killing machine that, uh, that uh, that's a machine that kills without human interference. And we managed to ban that one. Um, of course, that was a rather hard struggle. It took some years. Um, but very many of the same people that are involved in this campaign comes from the landmine campaigns in the mid-90s. And um, we've learned pretty much over those years, from the landmine issue to the, uh, through the cluster munition issue, and uh, of course, also the arms trade treaty process. As many of the, the, the many of the uh, actors behind this this uh, this, this <coughs> campaigns have been working on all these issues, and we are, or many of us that has been there since the since the the, the, the <coughs> 90s, working on these 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 type of bands, we see a lot more uh, you know possibilities, opportunities, when it comes to this campaign than we ever saw when it came to the clusters and the landmines. So uh, I'm quite optimistic. But let's hear what the academics have to say. Thank you. So, I'll just, new technology is quite frequently met with uh, the claim um, that this is something new, that IHL and human rights law is not sufficient and a new treaty is, is needed. And then the skeptics say, this is nothing new, this is just a small development, uh, IHL and human rights is enough and we don't really need a new treaty. Um, so the question is, is autonomous weapons technology, maybe this is off, um, really um, a qualitative and quantitative shift in military technology that means that old law actually isn't enough anymore. Um, we've now heard how there are features of the battle that cannot be programmed, and the question is, are there features of IGL that cannot be programmed? Um, and I'll give the word to Chet, who yeah. will illuminate us on this issue. We have sound. Now for the academics. <laughs> That's a nice intro. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kjetil Mujinic Larsen. I'm professor of law at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights at University of Oslo, focusing on international humanitarian law, among other things. My purpose today is to discuss the legality of fully autonomous weapons under existing international humanitarian law. I will not focus on human rights law, focus only on IHL. That provides only a fragment, I know that, but that let's keep it to IHL for the time being. My hope is to establish some legal premises for discussion on whether such weapons are already illegal, whether they should be banned, whether they don't need to be banned, etc. etc. A starting point for me is the statement in the Human Rights Watch uh, Losing Humanity report. One of their arguments on page 30, for those who have the report, they say, and I quote, 
An initial evaluation of fully autonomous weapons shows that such robots would appear to be incapable of abiding by the key principles of international humanitarian law. They would be unable to follow the rules of distinction, proportionality and military necessity and might contravene the Martin's Clause. Okay, so that is, I presume, the starting point for much of the campaign. That killer robots won't be able to follow ITL, as Alexander has also presented as a concern. Okay, this is not uh, an uncontroversial viewpoint. <coughs> One prominent actor who has presented a different view is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial <coughs> Summary or Arbitrary Executions, Christoph Haynes, in his report to the UN Human Rights, Rights Council. He said that is, it is not at yet, as of yet clear whether such robots would be able to comply with IHL, but it is foreseeable that they could comply in certain circumstances. Okay, rather vague and open, but that's, that's fair. Okay, so let's discuss what are the legal premises? What are the existing legal barriers uh, to take Alexander's? There is a very important distinction we must make under current international humanitarian law. The distinction between weapons that are inherently unlawful, weapons that are unlawful per se, meaning weapons that can never in any circumstances be lawful. Second category, weapons that are lawful but which can be used in an unlawful manner. Okay, where do autonomous weapons fit? Weapons that are unlawful per se, inherently unlawful. Let's look at that first. There are two categories here. Weapons that are of a character that means that they are incapable of being used in a lawful manner in any circumstance. First category of these weapons are weapons that by their nature cause superfluous Injury or unnecessary suffering. Okay, first category. This is now codified in Article 35, second paragraph of the Additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions. This is protection that, that is offered to combatants. Civilians are better prote protected by other rules under IHL. Chemical weapons, biological weapons, etc. Inherently unlawful because they cause unnecessary suffering, superfluous injury. This is a prohibition that does not apply to autonomous weapons, at least as a starting point. This prohibition is concerned with the effect a weapon has on a targeted individual, not with the manner of engagement. The concern with autonomous, autonomous weapons lies precisely in the manner of engagement, not the effect of individuals. Of course, an autonomous weapon can also be used to deploy chemical or biological weapons. Then it would clearly be unlawful, but then it would be on the effect rather than on the autonomy of the weapons. This is fairly uncontroversial, I think. The second category of inherently unlawful weapons is more controversial in this scenario. This category concerns weapons that cannot be aimed or which can be aimed but which have uncontrollable effects. The point is that such weapons are incapable of complying with the principle of distinction, which is fundamental in international humanitarian law. Any attack must be targeted at a lawful military target. Any attack must discriminate between civilians and combatants. If a weapon is incapable of making that discrimination, it is inherently unlawful. Okay, this is where autonomous weapons come in. This prohibition is, however, often confused with another prohibition, namely the unlawful use of lawful weapons. Lawful weapons that are used in an in discriminatory manner. That is a second prohibition which I will return to. 
are autonomous weapons inherently unlawful on this ground as being incapable of distinguishing between civilians and combatants? This is the big controversy. Hardcore IHL lawyers will say that only if there are no circumstances whatsoever where an autonomous weapon can be used lawfully, will it be prohibited? Only if there are no possible circumstances, they say. Making it rather high threshold for prohibiting weapons on this ground. Okay, autonomous, autonomous weapons. We have seen the example of defensive weapons. Weapons that are programmed so that they will destroy incoming missiles, for instance. <laughs> that is not a problem with distinction, discrimination. What about weapons being used in remote areas where there are no civilian involvement? Where there is simply only military objective. Hardcore ITEL lawyers will say, okay, this means that autonomous weapons are not prohibited on this ground. Michael Schmidt making such arguments. This is, I guess, where lawyers have to defer to technology experts. Can such weapons distinguish between civilians and combatants, between lawful and unlawful military targets? Is it possible that such weapons can be constructed in the future to make that distinction? That is not the role for a lawyer to decide. Our role is to say, okay, if it's possible to make that distinction, the weapon is not inherently unlawful. Under current IH. In relation to this prohibition on weapons that can't be aimed, weapons that cause unnecessary suffering, these inherently unlawful weapons, I must also point out the obligation under IHL to conduct a legal review of new means and methods of warfare. Article 36 in the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions. States have an obligation to conduct a legal review of all new means, including new weapons. So states have an obligation to make their own assessment. Will autonomous weapons be lawful, legal under IHL? United Kingdom making the argument that we, we do not see that these weapons can comply with IHL, therefore we will not develop them in Article 36. Consideration. Okay, so that are the inherently unlawful weapons. Whether autonomous weapons are inherently unlawful depends on this question of distinction. Second category of weapons, weapons that are not inherently unlawful, weapons that are lawful but which may be used in an unlawful manner. These are most weapons. Any gun, any rifle can be used in an unlawful manner but that does not mean that a gun is unlawful, only that its specific use is unlawful. Any use of weapons must comply with a wide range of rules under international humanitarian law, such as the principle of distinction. Attack can only be targeted at lawful military targets. Okay. Second fundamental rule, the rule of proportionality. Any attack is prohibited if the anticipated loss of civilian lives, injury to civilians, etc., is excessive in relation to the anticipated military advantage. Not extensive, not big, but excessive. Okay, what about uh, autonomous weapons? Can you say that this will be unable to comply with the principle of proportionality because it is unable to make that assessment? to make that comparison between anticipated civilian injury and anticipated military advantage. Third rule, the obligation to take all feasible precautions to avoid civilian casualties. Can autonomous weapons take such precautions? Do the humans who deploy these weapons violate this prohibition on precautions simply by launching an autonomous weapon. Fourth rule, rule of doubt, or the presumption of civilian status, if you want. If you are in doubt as to whether a civilian, uh, an individual is a combatant or a civilian, you shall treat him as a civilian. 
is an autonomous weapon capable of being in doubt, expressing doubt, solving doubts? Not as such. So what will an autonomous weapon do in that regard? Okay. There are also many non-legal arguments. Alexander has touched upon many of them. Autonomous weapons will make it easier to wage war, people say, because there's less risk of deaths in injury to your soldiers. Okay. Autom autonomous weapons make human emotions irrelevant. A robot can't show compassion, for instance. Fair enough. It's easier for dictators to turn on its own, his own people, some say, because it doesn't have to be afraid that the army will suddenly turn back on you. You can deploy this robot and it will do the damage. It increases the distance between the soldier and battlefield. Okay? It is horrible that a robot can kill a human being. Okay, these are moral, ethical, non-legal arguments. Not relevant, I think, for the assessment of whether these weapons are legal under IHL, but clearly relevant for the question of whether they should nevertheless be banned. Clearly re relevant. <coughs> but some scholars also argue that these weapons represent advantages in terms of IHL. Take the human emotion argument. A robot cannot choose to diso disobey IHL. Humans can. Humans can snap. Sergeant Robert Bales, for instance. Robots won't snap in that sense. They can't choose to dis disobey IHL. Will that increase respect for IHL? Question that is out there. Robots may achieve military purposes with less violence. Humans can kill in order to avoid being killed. Robots won't do that. Perhaps robots can achieve a military purpose with less violence. Capture, not kill, for instance, may be easier for a robot, potentially. Autonomous weapons can make the use of force more precise, present less damage, risk for civilians. The argument has been made by prominent IHL scholars. I won't discuss uh, the difficult questions on accountability. They are indeed difficult. What if a robot commits a war crime? who is responsible. I think these can be solved. They are intrinsically difficult, but they can be solved, I think. But the question, do we reach the limits of IHL? One argument has also been made about whether IHL is not really sufficient. The argument that these autonomous weapons are not weapons as defined. The argument is that throughout history, weapons have always been a passive tool that humans have actively, actively manipulated in order to achieve a certain purpose. If you take that active manipulation out of the equation, perhaps you should consider autonomous weapons not as weapons in IHL sense. Perhaps widening the scope of inherently unlawful means of combat, for instance, Okay, what if a means is unable to comply with proportionality assessments? What if a means of warfare does not have any free will? It does not have any understanding of intentions, etc. It is unable to make human assessments. If you take the weapons definition out of the equation, perhaps you can argue that these arguments mean that these weapons are inherently unlawful. But the more traditional approach would be to say these weapons are inherently unlawful only if they violate the principle of unnecessary suffering or the principle of distinction and is un are incapable of doing anything else. Do we then need a ban? We need a ban if we consider that these weapons are not inherently unlawful, but we want them to be unlawful. And we need a ban even if they are inherently unlawful, but we want to avoid the doubt, further discussions about whether they are, to make it clear this is unlawful. So if you want um, 
Clarity, perhaps a ban, is useful, even if you would consider them to be inherently unlawful. Difficult IHL, certainly, um, but very positive campaign. Thanks. Thank you for that very clear and very interesting uh, reflection. Now I'll give the word to Tobias uh, for a bit more detail on, on law and, and technology. Okay, good morning everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, I come from a slightly different perspective here. Um, my background is in IT law, and I usually don't uh, deal with humanitarian law and uh, not even really robotics um, as such. Um, in IT law, we focus on software technology, and obviously, once this software is implemented in a machine, uh, we, we're getting to interesting uh, aspects of autonomous technology that is implemented in a machine. Um, my role in, in this panel was uh, indicated uh, as I, sh I should play the role of the rational guy you wrote to me, which is an interesting, <laughs> yeah, exactly, which, which is an interesting task. Um, and given the fact that I don't have a good background in, in this area, and that rationality is a difficult concept anyway, I, I'm uh, probably more the naive guy who comes from the outside and who asks a, a few questions um, of uh, a rather naive nature. But also, I would see my role as trying to um, get into some kind of discussion here, uh, so not to bore the audience with three speakers who are of the same opinion. So in a sense, I'll be trying to play the devil's advocate or the killer robot's advocate, uh, so to speak. I'm not a, a fan of killer robots myself. Um, I would prefer to live in a world without killer robots. But I think if we are realistic about uh, the upcoming years of development and if we look into what is currently being developed uh, in different places in the world, um, we might be the last generation that is fortunate enough to live in a world without killer robots. And um, I'll, I'll get back to that. So my perspective is a broader perspective on, on robotics. I just spent the summer at Stanford Law School where I attended a conference on autonomous driving. And many of the arguments uh, there were actually quite similar to what we are discussing here. Um, I think it is realistic that we will uh, face a world where um, much of our surroundings will be automated and autonomous in, in the very near future. So the question is more generally, what can we learn from other areas of law, including uh, information technology law, and how can we regulate such a technology? So for me, the question is, is broader than just killer robots. It's more about how do we deal with um, uh, AI technology that is implemented, artificial intelligence uh, technology that is implemented in different machines. So yeah, the car, the car is uh, a Google car, um, and and. You can, you can drive that car on a highway currently. That was at least the model I, I was driving this summer. And then you press a button, and the car will bring you um, to, to the next uh, um, uh, exit at, at, on, on that road, provided that it has a, a good, uh, good map. So um, these, these cars are being developed in, in different uh, countries. Google is already rather close to, to something. And we, we do have um, the same level of, um, uh, the, the, the same levels of automation in, in this area. So in the uh, uh, driverless cars examples, we, we have 
all kinds of incremental steps from uh, cruise control to augmented cruise control to uh, the situation where in the Google car where you press a button and once you are on the highway you press a button and the auto drive comes on and you can you could theoretically start reading your emails or reading a newspaper but Google requires you to actually keep looking at the road and you are still responsible but there are also other machines out there that are a hundred percent driverless so we you, you can think of levels of automation where you at some point reach uh, uh, something like this here this is we could call it a bus or something uh, which is completely driverless and um, it's going to be deployed in Europe in th in the next couple of months it's very slow still it it won't drive on the highway it will only drive on on very narrow uh, narrowly defined roads and it will stop for pedestrians and so on um, so in in uh, in all of these situations we have the same accountability problems when we take the driver out of the car who is actually responsible is it the car manufacturer is it the guy who programmed the software who is responsible so we have to deal with this situation in in many fields including with with um, um, killer robots of course and um, so, so basically, these levels of automation are in theory thought to be incremental. So you add one step to another. But it's also possible to go right to the full, uh, fully autonomous car, at least in a very uh, narrowly defined uh, area. And um, I would presume that the same can also be done in a military technology. I was surprised at this conference at how many people um, were actually coming to that conference with a military background or developing, developing um, autonomous vehicles for the military. And, and obviously they couldn't share what they were doing, but I, I, I could get some, some idea of, of what they were doing. Uh, and for example, we were talking about um, vehicle to vehicle communication. In, in the civilian context, that make, means that when the f if you have five autonomous cars driving together, the first one breaks, then all five cars break because they talk to each other. So cars will talk to each other, and in the military context, you will have a situation where you could have five different vehicles approaching a target, and they could have different sensors, and they would talk to each other. So very much of this is already in development, and we might be a bit late with this discussion. So although we haven't seen everything that is being developed as yet, uh, my impression is that a lot more than uh, what we've seen is actually um, in the pipeline and, and could be deployed fairly soon. And obviously, once one country has such a technology available, it's going to be rather difficult to motivate other countries not to, to develop the same. The question is, for me a bit, why, why are we afraid of killer robots? Obviously, uh, it's, it's, it's a frightening thought. But perhaps the question is also, is it the hardware or is it the software? And from um, what I've heard so far, it seems that the software is actually where the problem lies. The hardware could be anything, and the software is the software that makes a decision about human lives. And that's obviously a difficult, uh, a difficult uh, thing, uh, a difficult software to program, and, and a difficult ethical problem. Um, but we see also that even in the autonomous cars, we have situations where the cars have to take ethical, have to make ethical decisions, and so, so if there is a traffic situation where the car has to brake for one person and then run into another person in order to uh, protect the first, um, the car may have to make decisions about which person to run over in, in an extreme situation. So um, the people developing these autonomous cars have to make some of the same judgments. And we will see 
situations where autonomous vehicles kill humans. And the, 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 the car manufacturing industry is already uh, preparing uh, itself in, in terms of how to deal with so situ such situations. And um, to me, it, it uh, would, would seem rather unrealistic to, to think of a situation where that can be the case for the civilian sector, but not for the military sector. So for me, the, the, the focus would be on the software rather than on the hardware, although the hardware might be the more frightening perspective when we look at it. Um, a question is more about the algorithms. How does the software make decisions and also about the use? In a sense, uh, for me, it's not fully clear what a killer robot is because in 20 years, when everything will be autonomous, you might get killed by a door. The NSA could have hacked uh, into the software of the door and uh, th they do an iris scan and bosh, you, this is the, <laughs> you would, I mean, I'm, I'm joking about it, but, but it's, it's, it's not fully clear what would be the killer robot. It's, it's perhaps more the, the software that makes an autonomous decision. And uh, I think we need to deal with these questions. I'm not saying we, we, we can just avoid them, but they are difficult decisions, both in the civilian and in the mil military context. So how realistic is a ban? This button here uh, is the red button you can press in the Google car when uh, you want to stop the auto drive. Obviously, you, you can also push the nice off button on, uh, on the steering wheel. But if, if nothing uh, works, uh, you, you can always press the off button. So, so can we just switch off killer robots by saying we want to ban them? This is, this is a difficult question. As I said, it, it seems to me that already much of this technology is in the pipeline. And uh, when, when some countries, technologically advanced countries, can be expected to have these weapons available, it's difficult to stop others from, from development. I would assume that the incentives to develop these uh, killer robots are fairly strong because um, it's a question of how do you protect your soldiers. And in in, in a public debate, there are uh, different ways to frame this problem. You could either ask people, would you prefer to be attacked by a soldier or by a killer robot? And they would perhaps say, well, perhaps a soldier, because with, with the soldier, I might still hope that the soldier has mercy with me, although that is, uh, there is not a very good evidence for that judgment. But when you ask parents, would you prefer that we send a killer robot or your son, then the answer might be in favor of the killer robot. And it's, it's probably the case that um, this public decision making w will rather focus on the, on the latter perspective, at least as, as, as I saw the discussion uh, about uh, soldiers in the United States where people are really uh, concerned about uh, loss of, of lives of, of their soldiers. And if there is any way to protect them, then one might go that way. So the question is whether, we are, whether this campaign is really preventive or where, whether it's already being developed and we are a bit too late to stop anything here. And um, in, in past contexts, we've seen that bans to weapons have usually happened after we've seen them in use and we've seen the excesses. And perhaps one way of, of dealing with this problem is to deal with such excesses on the one hand, and also to try to, to um, take a proactive step in, in the opposite direction in terms of ha asking how can we build such robots that they actually um, comply with international humanitarian law. So um, for me, the question is how should we regulate robots and artificial intelligence in general and a sub-question of that is obviously the military problem. 
Perhaps we need uh, more specific legal rules about killer robots in uh, international humanitarian law in order to distinguish um, different notions that we still don't have. Usually, technological the development is, is quicker than legal development, the legal development because we often don't have a good conceptual framework. Perhaps we need to develop that conceptual framework and find a way to reform the law that it takes into account some of these problems. For example, in the future it might be uncertain who is actually a civilian or a combatant. In a situation where robots fight robots, who is actually still a combatant? Is it the software programmer sitting somewhere? Or is it uh, only the president who decided to, to uh, send the, the killer robot? Th these are difficult questions. And also, how do you distinguish um, combatants from civ civilians? I'm not an expert in, in, in international humanitarian law. And obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult distinction already today. But in, in the future, perhaps software might be even more specific in making this, 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 this distinction. So you could have some kind of signature, uh, some, some kind of iris scan or whatever. So you could actually know who is combatant and who is not combatant. And you, you, might, you might have a much more uh, specific uh, targeting process uh, by these machines. So in, I think in the future, the question is perhaps more, how can robots be programmed to take into account legal requirements? And also, how can we uh, specify these legal requirements in a way that they can be implemented in software programs? We've seen that in other fields. Um, and I think it's at least one of the avenues that should be thought about in the future. Thank you. I'll give the word to Alexander. He looks very anxious to Absolutely. speak. And then Shetil can have a comment uh, in your room. Tobias, and then I'll open the floor for questions. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for, for your perspectives, guys. It's, 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 there's a lot of things to talk about here. But let's just to give some, f some, uh, some few short comments. First to Shetil. Uh, when you talk about um, you know, hardcore IHL lawyers, how they think, it's uh, almost impossible not to think about what happens when a political scientist meets a, a international lawyer. Of course, the lawyer would say that you know, states act because of this law. The uh, political scientist would say the exact opposite. I mean, it's because of power that we have this law. You know, because states act like this, we get law. Um, it's, uh, we, we touch upon this, uh, actually both of you guys touch upon this uh, on several occasions. And I think it's very interesting uh, here because um, because um, the fact that IHL is not clear on this issue is good enough argument to me to say that you know we need something more here. We need new uh, regulation. We need the ban. Uh, and um, and then you can say why um, or, or or how how plausible is that? Well, if you look at the power politics of it, it's quite easy. I mean, this is the next generation of weapons that will have an immense, an enormous uh, strategic impact. Of course, states are interested in this. Of course, they are interested in regulating this. And um, it also gives a little, a little parallel to, 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 uh, to uh, the export control regimes that we now have and uh, how they deal with drone technology in general. I mean, over the last 10 years, we've seen uh, lots of interesting things happening where, uh, where uh, the arms manufacturers and, 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 and others come along and say that, you know, we don't really have any export control regime for this type of technology because it's all new. But then you see that as soon as the drone technology, the killer drones and the drone warfare, for instance, in, 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 in Pakistan, <laughs> becomes politically relevant, that's when the export control system kicks in. That's when the, 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 the big powers uh, decides that, you know, we actually have to do something to restrict certain states, certain actors, to get hold of these weapons because it becomes politically relevant. Now that uh, drone warfare is happening, now that thousands of people are getting killed around the world uh, in drone warfare, these uh, technologies are much more interesting to control. The exact same thing will happen with the killer robots. 
Um, on the, the three issues that you mentioned, uh, or, or, or the three cases you gave, where, where, where you might think that a killer robot actually might be more humane, so to speak, in the, in the, in the battlefield, uh, because they don't snap, as you say. I agree with that. I mean, computers doesn't necessarily uh, snap as a human, but uh, there's, um, I mean, every, everybody who has a computer understands that, you know, <laughs> software failure is, is, uh, is even worse than snapping sometimes. Um, uh, when it comes to being less violent, I would say that uh, when, when, when you touch upon the, the other side of the, uh, of the issue by saying that, you know, it, it is highly plausible that, that, that you lower the threshold of, of committing violence. Uh, going into unnecessary armed conflict, unnecessary wars, because of this technology. And then, you know, how do you deem the killer robot to become less violent? I mean, if the violence wasn't necessary, that's difficult. And the, the third point about uh, robots being more precise, mm, I'm not sure about that. If you look upon the drone warfare we have already, Look upon the more than 4,000 people who have been killed in Pakistan in the, in the drone warfare there since 2009. I mean, there's less than 50 of them who are actually, uh, you know, named militants on the uh, CIA kill list. Uh, how precise are these weapons, really? Uh, the collateral damage is enormous. Uh, and, uh, you know, having that sort of technology where you don't risk your own life, you don't risk your own, uh, you know, uh, any, any, anything of great value by going to war, it's easier to go to war and it's easier to use military force where you wouldn't have done it if you didn't have the equipment. So uh, going back to, to Tobias, um, when you say that, um, that, um, that uh, the, the killer robots will come anyway, uh, that's, that's a sort of uh, point of departure. I'm just thinking that that, uh, that, that that's sort of defensive, isn't it? I mean, we have proliferation regime, uh, regimes for many other things. I mean, look at nuclear weapons. I mean, they've been around for 68 years. There's still, you know, most of the states in the world who, who, um, who don't have them and, and who don't get them because we managed to to put up all these, these uh, safeguards and, you know, non-proliferation regimes that actually works, that actually works. That, I mean, we have the technology and because it is politically relevant, because a state with nuclear weapons is much more dangerous <coughs> than states without nuclear weapons and because they actually <coughs> are politically important, we manage to control them to a certain level. Why shouldn't we do that with a technology that even isn't here already? I mean, th that should be much easier. Uh, just last point. Um, about, um, yeah, I'll try to make three points in one. Um, uh, so, uh, when you say rather regulate, I would say that, you know, we as peace activists, we are idealists, of course. That means that we're going for the ideal, the best. Uh, that's, of course, a ban. Uh, anything that is suboptimal is not something that an idealist should, you know, spend his time working too much on. But then again, if we don't get it, then I'm in for the regulation. <laughs> that, that's when we're going for it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um. yeah, I, I, I prefer also to have some time for questions from the audience, so yeah. just short, very short. I um, agree completely that ITEL is unclear on this point. You can make very good argument that these weapons are already inherently unlawful, therefore ban is unnecessary, but can have a symbolic effect, pedagogical effect, etc. You can make an equally well established argument that these weapons are not inherently unlawful, making a ban more important, if that is what one wish for. <laughs> and the point I forgot to make, of course, yes, software also fails. And software does not all, all only fail, it can also be hacked, which is the, one of the problems. Will we suddenly have hacked kill robots, which is not something we would really want to see, I guess. Um, just a third point <coughs> about what a ban would cover. That's also something we need to perhaps have a viewpoint on. Uh, these defensive weapons, are they really necessary to ban? We are thinking more about these offensive weapons that can kill on their own accord. But if an autonomous weapon simply is programmed to destroy incoming missiles, purely defensive, is that something that will be covered by ban? We need just to think about whether it should be all in encompassing or if it should be about offensive weapons. But that's a slightly <coughs> different story. Moving on. Any Okay, thank you. Um, so, 
non-proliferation is probably not a good starting point here because uh, in non-proliferation you have some states that have nuclear weapons and others don't ha that don't and they don't get them. Here you have a situation where many states are developing these weapons already and the, the technological steps for building that them are, are probably not that difficult and it, you don't need big machines, you need, you need a computer and y you will, you will ho probably have uh, some, some access to AI <coughs> systems worldwide and you could use such AI systems, that is the software, for diff different purposes including uh, in weapons. So, so this, the distinction between weapon software and non-weapon software is probably very difficult. And overall, for me, it's still not clear what would a ban exactly cover. So are you banning the hardware? Are you banning the software? How do you distinguish what is a killer software and what is not a killer software? Uh, how do you distinguish what is a killer robot and not a killer robot? So I think a lot of additional conceptual uh, thinking needs to be done before we can get anywhere with, with this. because. Um, if, you, if you want to ban something, you have to have a very clear idea of what is being banned and what is not banned. And I, 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 I do see this initial um, uh, anxiety about killer robots, and I, I share that as a feeling, but from there to having a legally binding ban I is, is a large step. And, um, to, to me, it's still fairly unclear what would be banned, uh, if at all. And if, if that can't be made explicit, it's, it's very difficult. And uh, particularly in a situation where all the development work is already going on, and uh, different uh, uh, military um, and, and civilian companies are, are working on this technology, then, to me, it seems like the genie is already out, out of the box. And we might have to look rather at regulation uh, rather than a ban. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're now ready to take questions from the audience. Would you please give your name um, and ask your questions? I think you're first. Consequences of war, and I feel that the bad. So to me, killer robots doesn't exist. It's the will of human people to use little boy, uh, for instance, uh, or fat man. To me, they are also killer robots. So I think that we should more focus on the consequences, because politicians and peace activists are going to, they, they do not talk about what kind of consequences when you shut the door, you kill people. So I think what all um, human uh, humanitarian studies and, uh, and uh, peace activists should focus on is the consequences of using different kind of software. Uh, I think uh, that is, we don't, we, to us it's very uh, nice and clean to have automatic war. 
So please, how can we focus not on what's going on first, but on consequences? Because then I think people would race against all kind of uh, war. Yes. Thank you. I think we're going to take a couple of more. I think there was one there, and then just behind her. Um. Gentleman. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Jacek Kowalewski. I represent the Polish NGO Central Eastern European Initiative for International Criminal Law and Human Rights. Um, I have a few questions, probably mostly to Mr. Um, sorry, um, Orion. Sorry. Um, I wanted to ask first whether ye, the coalition has any position with regards to non-autonomous um, systems that paradoxically could be almost autonomous. One of the arguments um, that is um, put forward is that those systems are that much, are that quick in the actual uh, battlefield that even if you leave um, some time and space for a human to intervene to have a decision, that effectively um, a human by natural, natural uh, constraints will not be able to make a proper assessment. So um, you, could, you could think of a system that leaves some time for a human to decide if there is no decision, the system will go for the option, the first option on the list, for example, yeah. So I wanted to kind of follow up on, on, on the doubt that was expressed by other speakers here. Where do you exactly draw the line, whether, whether you have any position on that non-fully autonomous, if you have a definition already about them. Um, then. Maybe to add to the question of the phalan on, on the phalanx systems, I think what makes this case even more difficult is that you have also land systems of this kind. I, th I think, as far as I'm aware, the Israeli are using an autonomous system that, that can um, react to, to mortar attacks, for example. Um, on the question of liability, uh, where are you considering or are you considering concepts from civil law from or from uh, corporate liability where where you could have or you have already in place in some jurisdictions um, solutions that assign liability to a corporation even in the cases where it's not possible to pinpoint the person who you know triggered pull the trigger uh, that result in some human rights violations on the ground you could have a system that makes a corporation and individuals within it liable because there is some fault in the organization, or an organizational fault, and so mm -hmm. eventually there is there is a, um, a liability. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I think we're going to take two more, and please keep your questions brief because there are a lot of <coughs> hands up here. Thank you. I'll be short. My name is Maria Hobodale. I'm a political science student at the University of Oslo, and I guess my question is mostly to Harang and Larsen. Do you at all? This might be a bit naive, but do you at all talk to the military industrial complex, like Norwegian actors like Kongsberg? Are they willing to have a conversation about this? Um, I would really like to know a little bit about that. I think that actually might be a question for Tobias as well, having mm. looked at his TV this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, one more. I think maybe. Yes, uh, my name is Ursula Gillis. I am uh, a board member of uh, Known to Nuclear Weapons here in Norway. Um, if we look to the development, uh, I apparently, unfortunately, I agree with uh, Tobias uh, Mahler that a lot of things is already going on. The next step would then be robots against robots. Uh, what is the current discussion about this aspect? Thank you. Okay, I think we're ready for some answers. Can I start off? Thank yeah. you. Yes, let's uh, let's uh, uh, start with the the. Uh well, we're going to try for one more round afterwards. So if you can okay. Start. Okay. <laughs> just 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 put questions, right? Um, on the on the position on 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 on, um, on uh, non-autonomous weapons, uh, the campaign is strictly on autonomous weapons. That's how it is now, right now. <coughs> but as I tried to to explain in the in the beginning, uh, there's a you know vast environment of, of scientists and researchers um, within the campaign working also on these issues that, that, that you touch upon. But just to make sure that the, the, uh, the, uh, the campaign is, is clear and concise and, and predictable, we needed to, 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 to put that, that very, very hard red line. 
Uh, I think that w what you, you touch upon when you talk about land systems uh, versus maritime and, and, and um, uh, also in regard to the phalanx system, um, it's pretty close to what Hietl touches upon when he mentions uh, defensive systems and, and the need to, to treat those systems in a, in a, in a slightly different way. And this is also uh, something that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the campaign has been thinking a lot about, of course, and which is also one of the reasons why we didn't address uh, the phalanx system, uh, which was already operational when we started the campaign back in, uh, back in, uh, <coughs> in April, just because we, we view this as, as, as a, a sort of intuitive <coughs> gray zone, which has to be, be, um, be dealt with on a, on a slightly uh, later stage after we have addressed you know, the impact of offensive weapons. So, so, uh, so that's the, the part there. On the technology and, 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 um, and do we talk to the arms industry about it? Sure we do. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody in the peace movement who do that more than we do. Um, um, I mean, like two weeks ago, we had the new director of the UAS Norway, the, uh, the unmanned aerial system. That's the, 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 um, the, uh, the, uh, the organization for, for, uh, for drone manufacturers in Norway at our seminar. Uh, discussing with them uh, on, of course, not only Kongsberg, but uh, more than, I mean, in, in, in the Norwegian Peace Association, we have a campaign now against uh, Norwegian uh, military production and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the linkage to, to drone warfare. Uh, we, have a, we have a pamphlet over there that you can have a look at. And we have defined more than seven companies that we are certain have a direct link there. Uh, and I mean, these are all members of UAS Norway, of course. I mean, these, these sort of sessions is, 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 is um, uh, I mean, that, that's we, we need to have that, that sort of contact to, to keep our campaigning going. Because, um, I mean, if you don't follow up on the technology and if you don't follow up on the business possibilities for the certain technology, you don't really get to address the right politicians either. Mm -hmm. So that's our experience. Liability to be asked, maybe? <coughs> Yeah. Well, liability is, is really challenging in, in all of these contexts. And my impression, at least from the autonomous car scenario, is that there is very much uncertainty about liability and, and ac accountability. And currently, the solution there is to go for some kind of insurance-based system. And, and w what that implies is... is uh, Obviously, dependent on the con on the respective legal context. So um, th this is a challenge. Um, just just to comment on on the uh, uh, on Kongsberg, since Kongsberg is is on my CV, that's Kongsberg Automotive. So I w I was working for a car manufacturer, not for uh, not for the. I, I wasn't contract. saying. That. No, <laughs> um, but but my 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 impression from from this conference I mentioned was that. Um, the military industrial complex is is reluctant to talk about what they are doing, obviously, because uh, they they are developing new systems and you, they don't know whether you're a, a spy or, uh, or what 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 other roles you might have, and they won't tell you much. And what we are seeing in terms of robots that are put on the market in the civilian sector are often then reused uh, technology from the military. So the military is two steps ahead. And what we see in the civilian sector uh, is already deployed in the military sector and, and has been deployed for a longer time. So, so I, I, I do think that the, the military industrial complex is, is quite far ahead there and much more than we would, would uh, know and, and like, like to know, yeah, like to have it. I think there are IHL questions coming up. I could see Nubu with his hand back there. So. Yeah, I can uh, try to address those. Uh, just about the robots against robots. If you're talking about the uh, limits of IHL, that is clearly where the limits would uh, come in. Kill robots would be perfectly legal military targets. That's clear. But the whole legal regime is founded on a balance between military necessity and humanitarian considerations. If you take the humanitarian out of the equation, what, what is left. And that is where a lot of IHL would be difficult to apply. Um, but that's, that's clearly the limit of IHL in a sense. But um, that's for even more distant future. Just the answer to the first 
the first question. I, I think the issue of humanitarian suffering as a result, mm -hmm. you know, this is not a video game. The video game is discussed a lot in, in connection with cyber war and, and with the drone wars, and, and obviously this isn't a video game. On the other hand, unfortunately, we are currently living the most photographed war in history in Syria. And, and you know, nothing is really happening and things don't get less complicated underground. Uh, so I think these are real, real challenges. You know, does more knowledge about suffering produce more political will or more action? Maybe it doesn't, or I think it, it's real that it doesn't, but it's still needed to produce any kind of political action. Um, yes, I, I think we're ready for a last round of questions. Yes, please, in the back. Thank you. Is it working? Uh, thank you. My name is Nobuo Hayashi from the International Law Policy Institute. Uh, I don't know if I would call myself the hardcore <laughs> IHL lawyer that uh, Hilton Larson uh, alluded to, <laughs> but uh, well, I'll leave that to your autonomous decisions. Um, on a uh, very brief uh, observation on uh, regarding robots versus robots, I think the IHL's answer is clear. They are all military objectives, inanimate objects, and therefore eligible for destruction. Uh, combatants, by definition, are humans, and so are civilians. Anyway. Uh, my comments relate more to perhaps some conflation between different concepts. One is what is a weapon. Second, what is a platform or delivery, delivery vehicle. And the third one is decision. I think there is a lot of misspeech concerning autonomous weapons. In fact, it's not the weapons that are autonomous. What's autonomous is the decision making that is autonomous. So, we humans use weapons and we make the attacking decisions so that the weapons can execute your decisions. Very much the same way, I think uh, what we call colloquially autonomous weapons are in fact conventional and perhaps not so conventional weapons that are activated and operated by a decision-making entity which happens to be increasingly autonomous, just like the car example uh, you alluded to. So. In a way, uh, and I, I, I take your point about mines, but mines are not really autonomous weapons. They are mechanical detonation devices. The attack decision was made sometime earlier by those who planted the mine, and the mine automatically or mechanically detonates upon pressure, for example. So it's not a, a very good example in my view as to how practical it is to try to ban autonomous weapons, whatever that means, because we are successful <coughs> in banning anti-personal weapons. I'm not sure the analogy quite sticks. Politically it is. Okay. But then, <laughs> if you look at IHL, I was surprised by the uh, lack of reference or amount, limited amount of reference to precaution. To me, precaution is in fact what guarantees. Most people don't know what precaution is. Yeah, precaution is that the, those planning or deciding to launch an attack must take precautionary measures. It's Article 51 uh, of Additional Protocol 1 that codified some of the precautionary measures. And if you read that, the first thing you see is that those who plan or decide to launch an attack shall take all these precautionary measures, make sure that we're targeting these military objectives and stuff like that. Now, if the question is, what, who or what is the addressee of that particular duty. IHL has been developed in the assumption that, at least until now, that those who are bound by that rule are humans. Now we are seeing the possibility that, in fact, non-human agents may make the decision. Then, I agree, accountability and so on might come in, but all talk about weapons, this platform, that, may not be all that informative. So software, hardware distinction, Yes, I think that's crucial in IHL's speech. It's simply weapons, platforms, and autonomous attack decisions. I think that might clarify our debate in the future. Thank you. I think we can take one, uh, the gentleman there, my colleague, Greg. And we're running a bit over time already, so if you could just keep it brief. Great. That may be a contradiction in terms for me, but anyway. 
the um, I've just been wondering what to call, the, what 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 the proper heading for today's session should be. Right now, it's killer robots, uh, but it's already been pointed out correctly that that seems to prejudge what shouldn't be prejudged, namely that the intent of these automated systems is precisely to kill. And I'll say that there's a strain, there's a lurking question that that ethicists sometimes discuss, and that is whether the aim of a soldier on the battlefield should be specifically to kill the enemy combatant, right? Now, it, in a lot of ways, that's a moot point because uh, the best way to, it, it, it's whether you should kill or simply aim to disable the other guy, right? Some people maintain that the aim should always be to disable, never to kill. But it turns out to be a moot point in most circumstances because you don't have the ability to discriminate the two. All right? The best way to disable is to, in effect, kill because in, you, know, you just don't have that fine-tuned ability to take steps that would only. Like snipers go for center body mass, which is most likely to kill because that's, just the, that, that, that's where you get your biggest target. Anyway, the reason I'm launching into this is Robots presumably would have better detection mechanisms, right? <coughs> presumably. And so they might be able to disa aim at disabling more effectively than human agents. I wonder about that, right? So maybe we should take the killer out. Maybe these are, and I would want to put in battlefield robots. But note that these sorts of robots could be quite useful in non-battlefield situations, hostage taking, settings, you know, so forth. So that's. Thank you. Um, last comments from the panelists? Anybody else? Well, 10 years ago, we had a conference about software agents, <laughs> and we were debating whether software agents could have legal personality and whether they could abide by the law and, and be subject, <coughs> uh, legal subjects. And at that time, it was uh, rather futuristic and not very clear to me how that would work. Uh, we are now seeing that software agents are being deployed in, in many fields. They make decisions on behalf of humans. We've had uh, a case in the Norwegian Stock Exchange that was recently adjudicated by the Supreme Court. And we, we can have software agents in military contexts. And uh, increasingly, I think we will need to revisit that discussion of how we deal with artificial intelligence software and uh, the decision making in such software and, and to what degree um, our current law is, is capable of uh, understanding the concepts behind this new technology and reacting adequately to these developments. Uh, very good points raised by Nobu, uh, as usual, I would add. Uh, I, I did mention precaution. Uh, I know I did l very little out of it, and uh, that is one of the areas where perhaps the discussion hasn't yen yet gone far enough. Uh, who are required to take precautionary measures? Can these robots fulfill that criterion? Uh, and that is a prohibition we don't all normally consider relevant for the question of inherent unlawful weapons, but perhaps it should be. Namely that robots, they are incapable of making the assessment of precautionary measures. Perhaps that makes them inherently unlawful. Uh, and clearly, it's a very valid point uh, where the discussion will move on. Uh, I also touched upon the question of robots perhaps m being able to use less force, being able to disable rather than kill, taking away the human, I wouldn't say tendency, but still, uh, the possibility that humans kill to avoid being killed. If you take that out, perhaps respect for IHL could even be furthered. Um, most important point, perhaps, Nobu, uh, concerns weapons, decision-making, platforms, etc. And that is certainly where we have to be very precise. What are we talking about banning? Uh, we use weapons. Perhaps that's inaccurate, as you point out. Perhaps this is a platform. Perhaps this is simply a autonomous decision-making. And 
that would clearly influence the discussions under <coughs> IHL. So discussion will continue, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the uh, last main argument I hear from Tobias about um, when uh, one country have um, this sort of technology, it will be very hard for others not to, to, to get it. Right now, I feel that this argument should be turned 100% around. It's a complete opposite. Right now, the biggest, uh, you know, the, the best thing we have right now is the US fear of others to follow. That's the biggest thing we have. Uh, now I'm talking just politically, uh, and I'm refer referring to the discussion that we have in Geneva and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, the, the, um, the, um, the way we discuss with, with, with the, the different um, uh, ministries of defense to, to get clear what is the doctrine on these things and so on. Uh, I mean, my experience right now is that, uh, of course, we have uh, US, we have Israel uh, that is uh, taking the lead on this. Already now, uh, U.S. is starting to to uh, to understand that uh, that um, <coughs> that uh, having China and Russia coming up, uh, developing the same type uh, systems, uh, it's uh, it just have to happen if they continue as they go. I mean, this is one of the main arguments to get them to stop. You know, uh, this is one of the main arguments for a ban. Uh, and when it comes to the, to, to the killer robots, um, you know, the term killer robots, of course, the, 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 the academic term would be lethal autonomous weapons. That means that, you know, the, the, the ability to kill is, is, is of course, relevant. Um, what you say is, is, is uh, I mean, I, I like your point, absolutely. But I, I, I would strongly suggest not to take out the killer of the killer robots, uh, not only for campaign purposes, but also <laughs> for, you know, <laughs> to, 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 to see, see, see what's in it. Because it's, I mean, if you look at uh, uh, if you look at look at, look at uh, the the the, uh, the traditional manuals of the infantry, uh, you have a lot of reasons why you, you know, uh, the 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 lethality is is the most important. Like for instance, if you look at New Zealand, uh, in the 1980s they had a manual, uh, the infantry in New Zealand, where where they 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 said that if you shoot and hurt someone in the battlefield, you will more likely get seven. Uh, of the opposite army uh, hold up in this, uh, you know, taking care of the, 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 the person that, that is shot uh, in uh, comparison to three if you kill him. So, you know, you take up more of the enemy force by, by, by just, uh, by just uh, hurting a person than killing a person. I mean, these kind of arguments, of course, they also fit into the killer robots uh, discussion, but, but that's more on the, on the doctrine level. Uh, and I think that, you know, at the point we are now, we, we, we are at a more you know, um, uh, political level uh, that has to do with, 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 uh, with, with getting these moratoriums and the talks on, on national moratoriums going and also to, to, uh, to, uh, to push as hard as possible through the UN system to get this, this, this global ban. And uh, I think that uh, that's where we're heading and, and uh, if you want to join us, come along. So thank you all for coming. Uh, Jody Williams will actually be here and talk about uh, the campaign and global activism at PREO September 17th at the annual peace address. And we will talk more about humanitarian technology later in the fall and I hope you will return for that event. Um, and thank you to the panelists for amazing presentations, extremely interesting and good luck with the campaign. Thank you. <laughs>